<laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> the cyborgs. <laughs> we are recording. All right. So we're going to go ahead and start the webinar and we'll give folks a few minutes to log in. I'll pull up my information to share in the chat. How have you been, Ken? <laughs> Good. I, I feel like there's like a, a chilling effect because it's it's been it's recording. I know, now it's hard to talk, right? All right. Well, let me let me do get the intro housekeeping stuff out of the way and then you guys can get into it for real. Okay. Um, so good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Jessica from Greenlight, and we are thrilled to host tonight's event with Seishu Foster and Arturo Ernesto Romo presenting their new book, Eladot. A History of the East Los Angeles Dirigible Air Transport Lines. They're going to be talking with Ken Chen, so you are in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Seshu, Arturo, Ken, and the team at City Lights Books for making this happen, and to you guys for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces right now, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. A couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see the you're here though and there are a couple different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event which we highly encourage the first is the chat which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like a speech balloon you're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat it's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees if you have a specific question you'd like to have answered please post that question in the q a you can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons and we'll be pulling questions from the q a to be answered in the later part of the program and very importantly, tonight's featured book is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person at our bookstore locations 12 to 7 p.m. every day of the week, and you can purchase the book and many others on site or order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup in the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll drop the buy link in the chat in a moment. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Okay, some introductions. Our interviewer tonight is Ken Chen. He was the 2009 winner of the Yale Series of Younger Poets Award for his book, Juvenalia, and has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and the Breadloaf Writers Conference. Chen served as the executive director of the Asian American Writers Workshop from 2008 to 2019, and also co-founded the cultural website, Arts and Letters Daily and Culture Strike, a national arts organization dedicated to migrant justice. He's going to be speaking tonight with our featured authors, Seishu Foster and Arturo Ernesto Romo. Seishu Foster taught composition and literature in East LA for over 20 years and, as, and, and at the University of Iowa, the California Institute for the Arts, and the University of California, Santa Cruz. His most recent books include the poetry collection City of the Future and the novel Atomic. Uh, I think I got that wrong. His books have received numerous awards, including the American Book Award, the Asian American Literary Award in Poetry, and the Believer Book Award. Arturo Ernesto Romo was born in Los Angeles, California in 1980. His artwork, mostly collaborative mixed media works, but also drawing, has been circulated internationally. His art making is pushed through explorations on the streets of East and Northeast Los Angeles, which feed into an ongoing series of collaborations with writer Seishu Foster. Their new book, El Adat, is a free fall into the long buried and fictional history of a utopian era in American lighter than air travel as told by its death defying aero acrobatic heroes. The book has been praised by such authors as Omar El Akkad, Mark Doten, Ben Ehrenreich, and Jonathan Lethem, who says, quote, Foster and Romo's real fake dream of the future past history of the East Los Angeles dirigible air transport lines is a superb and loving phantasmagoria that gobbles up real histories for breakfast and spits out the seeds. So you are in for something really special tonight. Seishu and Arturo are going to start us off with a reading from the book, accompanied by some images from the book and the larger project. And then they're going to be talking with Ken and taking your questions as well. So Seishu and Arturo, please take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, we're going to start with um, a reading and a slideshow which features excerpts from, from the book. All right. Here we go. On July 3rd, 2002, I arrived at Fresno Station of your East Los Angeles dirigible air transport lines looking for a flight to San, San Gabriel. To make a long story short, I'd walked to Fresno from Valley Children's Hospital where I had caught a small Eladat shuttle in front of the supermarket in North Fork. From where I'd walked, from a snuff out, the mountain road, all hot, holding my toiletry bags, 
mugwort stuffed in my pockets in thick clarity. I was very tired and your staff were hard to find and not friendly at all. Sergio printed my ticket and said the airship would arrive one hour late because they were having difficulties up there. When Sergio went on break, I talked with Joey, who told me he would announce the arrival and that I should go to sleep because the flight was delayed. The chairs in the station were plastic, like cheap plastic ones, and they were scattered all over the station, tipped over and upside down, and I couldn't sleep at all. The station was big and there was a dynamic echo. However, there was no food available because the concession stand looked like it had been burnt inside and boarded up. Everything looked blank and sick. I watched TV for five hours. The shows kept repeating. Paquita La del Barrio concert special, ESPN Super Sports Zone, Fresno KFSN local news, Paquita again. It was actually getting hard to arrange or locate my feelings. Joey wasn't listening to me, even though I kept seeing dirigibles come and go, first silver ones, then slightly orange ones, then brilliant pinks. coral reds, dull oranges, deep blue ones, and then black iridescent ones. Later in the night, I talked to Sergio and he asked why I hadn't boarded one of the orange dirigibles. He pointed to my pink ticket. It's already gone, he said. Next one comes at midnight, it's running late. It might be pale blue by the time it gets here. The inside of the station was all greenish by this time because I had walked through dense hot pine forests, old logging towns, down into the San Joaquin Valley, across Fresno, into the half-dead bank district, Payas Paredes, Botanica Poder del Mestizo, and dead government center, people waiting in lines forever, all depressed, to the green Eladat station. I was very tired when I was trying to solve my problem with Joey. And Joey was giving me the runaround. Sir, he said, I am not responsible for you missing your flight. I've been professional and diligent in my duties. Every flight that leaves, I announce here on this microphone mounted on this desk. The sound travels effectively up the wires from the microphone to the speakers. And if the speakers are broken and you can't understand what I'm saying, or if, sir, the speaker isn't working at all, I have been diligent in my duties to you and my company in announcing the outgoing and incoming flights and in no way, sir, have I been spending the last five hours watching TV in the back room. And sir, I have also not been drinking this whole time. My eyes are just like that. I was kind of born looking this way. So I ended up staying late, waiting for the next dirigible, the San Gabriel, which I boarded at 3.25 a.m. I enjoyed the carpet lining on the walls of the pale blue dirigible and the ashtrays were a plus. I spent the whole time on the viewing deck. I arrived in Stockton eight hours later and the station was closed. I wasn't tired anymore. I was over being tired. The station in Salinas was also closed, even though I called and they said they were definitely open. I waited outside in the wind the rest of the night. This was inconvenient, but educational. I double checked with LA central office over the phone and they said it was no problem, but they would alert the pilot to accept my pink ticket for the flat blue dirigible to San Gabriel. I felt relieved to know my ticket would transfer despite the 20 hour delay. There was a type of concrete bench beneath a palo verde. And so I watched its shadow sweep across around me when the sun rose, it moved so slowly. 107 degrees and dusty wind, Christian radio stations, agricultural birds, white skies. I was gritting my teeth, I'm sure. The flat blue was late by about four hours, and when a black opalescent came in its place, I attempted to board, but the pilot would not accept my pink ticket, despite assurance from LA. He said that he had not heard anything from LA. He said that my ticket was not a ticket for this or any other flight, and that if he accepted my ticket and let me go home, then he would have to let everybody else with a pink ticket board, and that even though there was nobody else at the station, it wasn't really his job or his choice to let me board. I asked him to have a heart, because it was late and there were no hotels open and I could redeem my ticket at the next stop in Delano. He said, I'm sorry, but the only way to keep this airship company running is to follow the rules and where would America be without the rule of law? 
There were, there were moths on the inside of the airship. I could hear them hitting the balloon's skin. Okay. So uh, why don't we cut it there? How's that? Um, I'm going to give you a round of applause. Zoom is really weird, um, but you couldn't hear because I was muted, but I was cracking up the whole time. Um, <laughs> and uh, for the studio audience at home, I thought I'd share um, this, this dirigible that my kindergartner age daughter made um, that's very on theme. Um, well, I, I hope that you, for those of you who are watching at home or maybe on YouTube a millennia from now, uh, can buy the book. Um, it's a really beautiful object. And it, 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 it's a kind of book I wish I could have discovered when I was like uh, 19 or something, because it's just sort of like um, maybe all the things that are like enjoyable from like science fiction or beat poetry or like uh, comic books or zines or like random things that you find are kind of like all pulled into this centrifuge into this book. Um, and so it's a little hard to explain because I think before I had actually read it, I thought it would be more like a science fiction novel or more like a political history. But it, in fact, it's like much more uncategorizable than even the market copy would suggest. Um, so I guess maybe I just start by asking, uh, you know, like I, I remember hearing about this project like eight or 10 years ago, and I know it's been a long time in, in gestation. And I know that there are a lot of inspirations um, and a lot of it comes out of your process, but I'm curious, like, what was the origin for this process? Like the, the origin for this book, like did it always start out being a, uh, like uh, about dirigibles? Um, was it originally gonna be something else? Like what, what, what was like the timeline in terms of how it took shape? Uh, well, I, I think <clears throat> we, the first time I heard of, I think Seshu's, Seshu in my process is one of, of a type of riffing back and forth, um, both with writing, um, as some of you might know, Seshu writes like, must write like thousands of postcards um, and send them out. So I'll receive postcards um, I would send him drawings, and we were always in dialogue, both through writing, correspondence, and and drawings, and um, and I think just in some of that correspondence, uh, so she started referencing dirigibles, um, and we started riffing on that. At the same time, we were really doing a project around East Los Angeles, the documentation, um, kind of a broad broader definition of documentation of place. Um, so doing a, a nonfiction, but also fictionalized um, explorations of East Los Angeles, which kind of just meant that we were we were driving around East LA, taking photos, talking to people, doing interviews, and then also you know um, remembering things and committing them to a website called um, elaguide.org. Um, and within kind of that context of exp exploration of place, Seshu brought in the dirigible, and then as we do, we started kind of joking about it, building a narrative around it. Um, and then that, that was one of the ways that the dirigible story entered the, the stream of our, our, of our process. Um, yes. And I guess that theme and the trope of part of our exploration of, of East LA was the mysteries of East LA and that as we drove I don't know, dozens or hundreds of miles around East LA, uh, summer after summer, um, exploring birrerias and taco trucks and marisco trucks. Um, uh, we'd, we'd come across um, things that we couldn't explain like stairs that went up a hillside and, and led nowhere. Um, that apparently there had been structures, houses, or whatever it may have been that the stairs led to, but the only the stairs were there. So stairs to nowhere, um, houses uh, in the built in a place where they could get no utilities and were therefore um, boarded up and dark. Uh, sort of strange, unexplained little bits of history that that were present in the landscape in 
in little clues like the viaduct that where uh, Huntington Drive turns into Soto Street and there was a trolley stop right there. Um, but of course the trolleys had been disbanded 50 years earlier. And, but the trolleys, the trolley station was there. So these kinds of things were part of the built landscape that we had questions about. And, uh, and so that was part of it. And, and also Arturo uh, had made uh, pamphlets as part of a project he was doing called the Botanica Poder del Mestizo. And, and maybe you could say a little bit about that. I don't remember the first time that installation project, that art installation was placed in an actual location. But he, he did this, um, this installation based on a Botanica, um, which maybe he can explain more later. But he, he did these pamphlets related to the uh, um, features of mysterious features of East LA. Yeah, so the the Botanica that was an, that was like another project I was working on. I think the projects all all had to do with a sense of um, a sense of responding and belonging to a place. Um, and the Botanica Poder del Mestizo was was a fictitious botanica and also a multi generational collective of healers that had uh, that had come that had retained their healing their healing um, traditions, their metaphysical practices, and also come to LA from different parts of Latin America. And so in that fictional storefront, um, that fictional storefront then produced pamphlets, uh, posters, flyers, and those I would post and, um, and hang in my neighborhood. Hmm. And um, that, that type of feeding back, like absorbing, absorbing stories of a place, and then feeding them back into the place was like a very strong part of, of my art practice, um, both on the street and then eventually in, in galleries that Seshu was talking about. But what gave it a little more life and depth to me was that Seshu would then adopt those same narratives and then add narrative to it. And so Botanica Poder del Mestizo, for instance, appears in both my work, but then it also started appearing in Seshu's work and then it started appearing in in these in this collaboration that eventually led to the book and botanicas for those who may not be familiar with them are like herbal remedy shops that are full of things like votive candles and sacred objects that you can place in some alcove in your house um, that you can devote to healing practices um, and they're very sort of what like uh, folkloric and vernacular and um, and come out of sort of a mix, a big mix of of traditions in Latin America, Catholic um, and otherwise. That sounds amazing. Um, I wish I could have gone to one of those pop ups uh, or installations. Um, I mean, I, I feel like you can really get a sense of the book as the two of you having a lot of fun and riffing and um and also Seshu I feel like you're like the poet laureate of the automobile you know like um you can kind of get a sense of you the two of you kind of passing through spaces and like com reacting to them and I think that's what gives the book such a weird texture where it's like uh, a fictional history or like a you know like a uh uh local like urban geography of a place that's like both very real and also doesn't exist um so i mean it seems like it's very important to read it as a like a geography in terms of so many different things uh of uh east la you know i'm like i think when most people who aren't from southern california think of la they they have very stereotypical ideas about you know like hollywood or venice beach or something like that um and you know generally the there are other places that are sort of not on the map or that are erased histories and, you know, places like Boyle Heights, which is like predominantly like Chicano or like, you know, Asian. Um, so I, I, I was wondering if you want to say anything about East LA just for people who might not be familiar with it or, or um, how you, 
it kind of became like underwent like a metamorphosis in your process because there are parts where um like i'm curious about these interviews that you did for example you know like there there are a lot of parts in the books where it seems like you're um clearly trying to preserve real history of real places or there are people you mention and it seems like sometimes they're real people you know um you know or real organizations like kiwa you know and so um but a lot of times the the place is both real and a kind of like hallucinatory like bad xerox version of it or something so um yeah what would you want people to know about east la or boyle heights and and how did you find it um kind of like transfigured by your process um i think ken i think that's a really accurate description of of some of the narrative i feel like the narrative has to fold in and out of myth it has to fold in and out of myth we live in the town of hollywood which is 24 7 broadcasting these stereotypes and myths of everything from chicanos as gangbangers and uh you know the criminal low life element uh broadcasting that uh and narcos uh narco traffickers across the entire globe um bathing the globe in these weird uh myths and and stereotypes and and so to to a certain extent the myth and stereotypes are therefore inescapable they're sort of part of the the landscape um and um so some of the bad uh bad xerox copy of of uh actuality i th i feel like is that interface and that resistance to myth um and and that the people themselves are are also um that humans are are dreaming at all times and sometimes these consciousness takes the form of um of narratives and then we give a counter narrative to that sometimes people live by assumed narratives that they themselves are not conscious of and then we're applying a um a, a specific, excuse me, specifically place-based narrative that's counter to that, uh, based on our own uh, experience of the landscape that we keep crisscrossing and traversing. Um, that, um, yeah, I probably said enough. Arturo, why don't you pick it up? <laughs> um, I mean, I think there's a way to. I guess one of the things that I appreciate about the collaboration with Seshu is that there are ways to appreciate space that are collective. And I think that's one of the features of the narrative of the, of the book is um, it, it's, it's like a counter narrative in a number of ways, um, including the ways that we exist in space. Like East LA is both like a hidden place. Um, it's a place that, you know, up until recently, if you got a travel guide to LA, East LA would be covered by the key of the map. <laughs> um, it would be like, there's Hollywood, there's West LA, there's Santa Monica, and then like there's no man's land over here. Like you don't want to go over there. Um, and Hollywood, like Seshu said, has generally like avoided East LA except as like this, this mythical place of lowlifes and of danger. Um, and so it's existed like that for a long time, but at the same time now, East LA and Northeast LA are undergoing hyper gentrification and hyper displacement. And that means that at once we're being ignored and then also mischaracterized. Like there's that long history of boosterism of LA. Like LA is the place where you go to remake yourself. Um, you don't acknowledge uh, Tongva people, original indigenous people of Los Angeles, they're erased um indigenous and mexicano people are erased uh black people are erased so there's all these erasures happening in the reimagining of los angeles and that myth um and so i think i think the the like the process of making the book and the book is about like a different way of interacting with with 
a specific place, like Sesh is saying, place-based work that isn't about gentrifying a place or sanitizing it or boosting it for commercial value. Um, and it isn't also about ignoring it or like casting another thing over it, uh, mischaracterizing it. It's the question of like how me and Sechu were kind of asking, how do we, how do we belong to place and represent place at the same time? And in this con kind of way that counters exploitative uh, forms that can leak into all of our creative processes as artists. And I know that um, gentrification itself is sort of posed as a, a contemporary thing, 90s to the present. Um, but really, uh, East LA has been sliced and diced by uh, freeways uh, ever since freeways were first invented. The first freeway goes through um, Highland Park in, in Los Angeles, the, the very first freeway in the country. And then other freeways were purposely put through through East LA, um, and uh, Union Station in I think it was well, around 1934. Maybe it was earlier. Around 1934 was placed on top of Old Chinatown, so Old Chinatown was raised, and Union Station was uh, built there. Um, and so the communities of of Los Angeles that are east of downtown have have been literally physically um, erased and displaced for generation after generation. Um, and uh, yeah, and so it's it's part of m people's history over multiple generations where um, where they've had to been displaced and then recover sort of recover their equilibrium or recover their lives um, and move on. And so some of the cyclical, cyclical past and present um, enfolding and give and take in the book is, is related to those kinds of continual cycles of rebuilding and resistance. Yeah, I, I've actually been reading a lot about some of these histories in in Northern California this year, and I feel like the the book is really timely, given that we just come out of this year where all these people have been evicted, and you know there's increased homelessness, and private equity is like seizing up property everywhere, and uh, I think the Republicans just came out to say, you know, can we uh, stop the like moratorium on evictions, uh, and you know, I think people who live in places like Brooklyn or in LA or San Francisco, you know, think that they are in a kind of progressive paradise. But, you know, something, you know, Brooklyn where green light is, is like a kind of like front line of gentrification. And, uh, you know, in San Francisco, as you know, the same thing happened where, uh, you know, Chinatown was bulldozed like several times, like in the early 20th century, and then through urban renewal, you know, alongside, you um, uh, Richmond Hill, which was like the Harlem, the the Harlem of the West, you know, um, alongside Japantown, you know, and and Oakland. So I I think one thing that's kind of interesting is that um, I, like a lot of the blurbs on the book, um, they say this book is an alternate history, and what I didn't really feel that way when I was reading it, and I think part of it is um, I I was thinking just now this lecture I was hearing about uh, that I saw like many years ago that was like a bunch of post-colonial professors, you know, and they were saying, you know, um, like it, you know, you, if you look at the history of like capitalism and slavery or like the British occupation of India or whatever, whatever. And someone was like, these alternate histories are really important. And then another interlocutor on the panel was like, these are not alternate histories. It is the actual history, you know? And so like the thing of like LA being this like deeply like multi-ethnic, like place that was like originally native land, you know, where there was like a history of Chinese exclusion, and like Japanese incarceration, you know, like I kind of felt like your, your, your book was like fabulism that was like built on in the actual history, not the alternative history. And so um, in, in a funny way, I almost feel like that like actual history might be like almost more um, surprising or like different to like some readers than the 
than the kind of phantasmagoric, like, uh, you know, inventive stuff. But I was wondering, like, um, I mean, I feel like there's a lot of directions to go in this, but um, I mean, I, I, you were just talking about land uh, and, uh, you know, we're talking about um, gentrification and Arturo, I was, I was reading one interview where you're talking about, you know, like land has a really different meaning in a kind of like settler colonial context where it is sort of like, you know, th the thing that is expropriated. And, you know, I was wondering if you had thoughts about like, the both of you had thoughts about like the book from like a kind of native perspective or about, you know, you were just talking about the botanicas, you know, and in, in the title, um, like, you know, I thought I was very clever to notice this until, you know, it, I, I learned it was very obvious, but the title, you know, seems like it's like a Nawa word, you know, um, I'm not sure if it's a real word or not, but, you know, I'm kind of curious about like, so Seshu, like you had this book also Atomic Aztec, you know, um, but I'm sort of curious about this sort of secret history of the book. And I guess the secret history of the, the site of East LA as a sort of native place. Um, yeah, I, I think, so there are layer there are layers to it, and um, I want to be precise in the way that I'm describing it from my own position. Um, yeah, Los Angeles and and uh, East Los Angeles, the whole LA. I mean, all of all of uh, Turtle Island is indigenous land. Um, but I think what the book for me is about is less. You know, I I'm not Tongva, um, and I. I I um I don't identify myself as as indigenous. Um, I identify as Chicano and mestizo, and so that's part. That's mostly. I mean, that's all where where the book up from my end is coming from is from that that experience of Chicanismo, and of being a second generation Chicano. And for uh, those who don't know, uh, Chicano is a politicized uh, term, uh, politicized Mexican American, um, generally in the Southwest, but we can exist anywhere. Um, and, and I think that's where the, and, and because, because of that, it's like the, the use of, um, or the idea of indigeneity and mestizaje in Chicanismo is like, is like a layer of complexity that, that takes me a while to explain, but I'll try, I'll try my best. But so Chicanismo and my understanding, um, was a, was founded on this idea of having moved and having been displaced and lost. And so that's, that, those are themes that exist in the book, like Seshu was talking about, like East LA cut up, East LA has layers of erasure on top of it. And Chica, Chicanismo and the Chicano identity is also one of having lost, having been maybe born of revolution, having left Mexico, having arrived in a place that was, that you had a, that had a Mexican history, but also did not have a Mexican history. Uh, Mexican history was one of conquest as well over indigenous people. So there's layers of history and Chicanismo is and was a project of kind of reclaiming, re re remembering uh, where we came from and, and kind of fighting against that amnesia of both like mestizaje in the Mexican context, but also uh, assimilation into American culture. And so because of that, it, the reach back to ancestry isn't always perfect, you know? And I mean, I for one don't think it needs to be, to be healing and to be important and politically important. Um, but that's, those are the characteristics in the book that, that like the, like Ella Dot, the title does refer to Nahuatl language, but it's not a Nahuatl word. And so, uh, and there are many instances in the book that speak to Chicanismo more than indigeneity, because I don't think that's necessarily where me or Sashu are coming from. Although part of Chicanismo is, has always been in solidarity with indigenous movements and with movements of all oppressed people and all colonized people. So uh, it's, it's complex, but it's beautiful, beautiful and complex. But yeah, Chicanismo as a philosophy, as a practice, uh, as an art movement plays heavily into the, into the book. Yeah, so I, I grew up during the Chicano movement of the 60s and 70s when the, the height of the Chicano movement with, um, oh, with uh, 
sort of the the fight for Chicano studies at UCLA and later and um, the UFW boycott of of grapes and um, and so on and so forth. But but it was an interesting um, project for me in that the politics of in indigenismo and in, in, in indigeneity um, involve um, trying to to not deny the the um, native native roots native past um, and 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 therefore actually providing resistance against just the assimilation of you know go to college get your degree and and don't look back um, you know move out of your community be socially mobile and uh, just make money and assimilate into into consumer culture um, but the ind indigeneity of the Chicano movement um, proposes that people have an actual relationship to the place that, and cultures that they are from um, and that it is it is a necessary part of their their identity and their community and their and a healthy life to to have a politics that doesn't just involve pure assimilation um, you know into the into the cultures that we know and loathe um, <laughs> uh, and so um so yeah, there's there's that there's that kind of politics behind the the use of that kind of indigenismo, I guess. The, thank you. Those were great, um, very nuanced answers. Um, so I feel like we we've we've gone um, in a in our usual radical serious direction, um, and I wanted to reassure um, people that the book is also really funny and. Um, I found myself reading passages out loud to people or, or taking photos and texting them to, to, to people in an attempt to bewilder them. And I, I feel like there's a way, so to give a few examples, like there's a job posting to be a poet of, poet of the universe. There's a, a, a flying squid kraken that may or may not exist. There's a war between the blimps and the dirigibles. Uh, there's a series of sort of epistolary notes written by people like King Kong and uh, Harry Truman <laughs> and Smokey the Bear. So if any of these things entice you, you should definitely get the book. Um, but I, I guess I want to talk about that humor a little bit because um, in a way, like, you, you know, there are these passages in the books that are really, uh, you know, political that are about state violence or that are like, you know, I think there's one scene that's like literally, um, you explaining commodity fetishism or something in terms of like the, the workers do all the work but like it, it's all invisible you just have commodities but then like the large swaths of the book are super you know bonkers you know and i feel like a, a way to describe this in a more like highfalutin literary way is it's like i feel like there's this like tradition of like proletarian or like movement writing which is to be like as down as possible, agitprop, didacticism. And then there's a sort of like more like countercultural, uh, like uh, bohemian side or like a Dada side or more surrealist thing. And so I think one thing that's really unique about this book is that it's sort of doing both of those things at the same time, which is very rare to find and that you often, you know, read very earnest, but, but in your face, radical writing, or you find kind of like, uh, playfully surrealist writing that has no connection to like reality. So, um, I mean, this is a kind of general question, but you, we were talking before this about, how, before the event started about how it seems like maybe the reviewers aren't always like tapping into the sense of humor. Um, I'm sure the two of you cracked each other up while you were like riffing back and forth. Um, what, what were some of the, the things that surprised you um, sort of when they, kind of came at, came into being, um, you know, what were, uh, were, were there things you thought were particularly weird? Um, how, and you were kind of surprised that they ended up in the book. How about like, 
some sometimes the interface between the politics and the humor is like interesting where like you're purposely like destabilizing the like dramatic moment or the like political screed. Yeah, yeah, I think that's all right. That's all right. I, it may, it reminded me of reading like my political education happened in zines, like zine forms. And like the amount of typos and <laughs> and like really just hilarious like randomness in a zine is was great. I mean, that's that that contrast that you talk about between like this really serious didactic agitprop type writing, I and mean, then it's riddled with typos or riddled with like things that don't make sense. Um, that's always felt alive to me. It's like that's like the the I think Sesh has talked about it before. Like that's like like the multi the multiplicity of of like political movements and community is just like all these different types of voices and they're all happening at once um the, some of them are just really hilarious and, and and absurd and some of them are like very poetic and beautiful and you know it's a, a kind of a cacophony and i think that's like to me that's that's what we were also trying to do like we had our antenna up for that type of that type of um variety of tone and not just in the writing, but also in the in the visual representations, there's a lot of tone, there's a lot of like tonal shifts that are like, um, you know, like, like a black and white photo has this like heavy weight of history on it, it verifies the truth. But there's a lot of images in the book that that actively undermine their own weight. Um, and, and I think that's just I, to me, to me, that's just that's just a, a product of really listening to the multiplicity of voices in a community. And Arturo had this idea of folly, you know, folly as as being a necessary kind of aesthetic, I think. Um, and I feel like like that is important because the Chicano movement sort of came and and then exploded in, into a fireball in the 70s along with you know the Black Panthers and a bunch of those other um, social movements that um, that fought hard you know they they sort of they sort of fought hard they made a lot of changes possible but um, but their internal contradictions caused them to collapse um, and and a lot of people sort of wash their hands of of that kind of radical politics in the in the eighties, and you know, decide to vote for Jimmy Carter um, or Ronald Reagan, and and uh, and sort of uh, put all of that all of the movement in the past, um, and uh, and you know, one of the things that that we are interested in is looking at flaws and and folly as as part of as part of as part of the whole picture um, that you know it's not some kind of scientific positivism uh, Marxism Leninism that 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 is calibrated you know with some kind of uh, supercomputer pr precision. Uh, drone strike to lay a hit on uh, your enemies, but like it's a human movement, and so human movements are full of contradictions and error and and uh, and folly. Um, so so that such that, for example, um, after after having after East LA only having. Uh, representation by white city councilmen, like one guy for 20 years who was a car dealer. Um, the, the, first, the first two Chicano um, city councilmen who, who, who were able to utilize <clears throat> movement support to, to get on the city council were both, you know, ended up under indictment um, with like the last guy, I, I saw him at a art gallery and he was chatting with a reporter guy, a friend of mine that I know. And then later come to find out that 
he bought cocaine from an undercover agent outside of city hall like who would do that who would buy cocaine from an undercover you're a city councilman you would like have to buy it right outside of city hall you know like and he was like the most progressive guy on the whole city council too and then he later like has heart attacks because he's been doing so many drugs and then like i don't know where he ended up now but like you know so it's like one step forward, two steps back. That's part of the that is part of the struggle. Yeah, and there is a kind of Dada element in that. You know, Dada was a reaction to the tremendous cataclysm of World War One, where all sides pretended to be super rational. Hmm. Uh, you know, agents of in their own interests, but. You know what did it lead to it led to this total world-class cataclysm loss of millions of lives i feel like that's the most um uh, sympathetic explanation of data i've heard uh but uh or contextual it's interesting um i thought i'd read the first of these questions by carla diaz hi carla okay. um so uh, she says, Arturo, curious to see how you negotiated and choose what medium to work with as an artist. Drawing, video, were there any challenges in this collaborations working with the writing and the stories? And maybe a way to kind of say that more generally is like, I was really curious about the nuts and bolts of your collaboration. Like, I, I think I initially assumed like Seshu, you wrote everything and then Arturo, you did the images, but then I kind of realized it didn't seem like that was the case. And uh, and it seemed like a lot of it was also, it wasn't like there was a division of labor in that way. Like it seemed like this sort of like, you know, organic riffing in that kind of way. And, and it also seems like there is this community part. Like I'm curious about, um, you know, the interviews you did or about the, it, there's almost like a, um, like strata or something like you're building like layers. So yeah, so it'd be great to, um, Arturo, if you have thoughts on some of Carla's questions about kind of your mediums as an artist and then kind of broadly about your your collaboration. Um, hi, Carla. I, I think that the, well, the drawings in the book serve the purpose that a drawing might traditionally serve in a book. Like they're kind of, they, they open the chapters and um, the drawings had this style of that where I was trying to go for a time period, maybe like a 1930s time period, a 1930s lithograph. Um, so there were like refer heavy references to cubism in the, in the drawings. And then the rest of it was just, you know, I, I wanted to play with photography just because photography, like I was saying earlier, it has like this, uh, uh, this connection. Yeah, has this connection to to the archive and to history and to the, you know, like to the veracity of history. Um, it proves that things really existed. And then I could also undermine them by Photoshopping the images so that um, at once showing you something that looks real, but at the same time, you know, it, it couldn't possibly be real, um, which is kind of the, the slipperiness or the slippage of the, of the book, like memory and recovery works that way. Like, like you remember something might happen and there's and and there's all these different ways of recovering and remembering and being like you have your dreamscape your dream world and your historical world and your physical world um and they 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 kind of like come together and they our our idea of ourselves or our idea of our place in history is like way more informed by dreams than I think we acknowledge, you know, <laughs> way for, way more informed by fictions than I think we acknowledge. And so that's what the, I wanted to get to a point where if you saw enough photos in the book, you would start to question every photo. Like every photo would be real and every photo would be like, wait a second, is that altered also? So I wanted to undermine the, the, uh, the idea of like the photo being proof and in terms of the way that the images and the text came together, I think because me and Seshu have been working together for so long, even before we decided to make the book, I think that I felt 
that I that we were able to step outside of what might be traditionally the relationship between an artist, visual artist, and a writer, which is that sometimes the writer, sometimes the artist is asked to illustrate the book. And we didn't conceive of it that way because we were constantly in dialogue between image and text. Um, and so the story, the story, I like to think about, about it as if the story was created through images, like imagining images and imagining narratives and, and, and words. And so it was kind of co-constructed in that way rather than the text being form fully formed and then me illustrating it. Um, yeah, so that, that was kind of the relationship between the two and they share quality, like tonal qualities, qualities of like half remembering, uh, maybe hallucinatory qualities. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's what I, that, those were my goals in terms of using photography. There's also like, I guess one more thing is there's also like the zine or typographic element in the back, especially with the appendix, the appendices. And that's more, those are more references to like the zines I was talking about earlier. There's a facsimiles, yeah, like Ken is showing. So those are all visual references and visual pointers to archives. I think there's another through line too, Arturo, to your in your practice in that you had you had work that was always an intervention in place, mm -hmm. like the time you put on a, a rabbit mask and you walk from Lincoln Heights to downtown, and um, or that you set up a, a Botanica Poder del Mestizo in a in a site. I think it was in Eagle Rock or Island Park. Mm -hmm. um, and so you had these actual like installations and performances that that took place uh, on the east side and um, and the book is attempting to do that also the book is attempting to to embody itself on the east side and have the east side embody itself in a book mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so but what would you say about medium in, the, in that regard? You know, Carla was asking about choice of medium. I mean, at one point you pulled your, you sort of pulled yourself out of the, muse out of the museums after you participated in the LA County Phantom Sightings post Chicano movement <laughs> uh, exhibit. Yeah. Um, I mean, medium, in this book and in most of my work, mediums are just, they're just like symbols. You can just play around with any medium because every medium has like a historic, a historic um, lineage. So photographs represent certain things to us in general. Drawings have this certain tradition. Um, a drawing that looks like it's cubist has this certain reference point that you can then attach to. So a lot of it was just the choice of medium was like, what does this, what tone does this establish that kind of will interfere or complement or juxtapose with the tones that are going on in the book? Um, what new meanings can we create if I start to interfere with the narrative of the, of the book by contradicting it? And what breakthroughs or seams can we open if like Seshu writes about an explosion of a dirigible and you're like, okay, yeah, right, total fantasy. And then you turn to the photo page and you see like this photo of a dirigible exploding. Um, and so it was, the choice of medium was really just about playing with the conventions of, of truth telling in books, like photos, uh, drawings from a certain era, uh, pointers to time periods. There's a lot of pointers in the book to like the 30s, to the, to the 60s, to the 90s. Those are kind of like our touchstone periods and then into the future. So looking at all those things, I, I chose media, media that would that would be reference points to that, that would point to those. Sort of visual quotes to anachronistic styles, styles that right. relate to, that are time period specific. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, we have a question from our friend Lisa Chen. Um, who asks, how did you know when and how to end the narrative as collaborators? Hi, Lisa. 
How do we know when to end the narrative? Or how to and end it? We didn't end it. Well, it seems like you two could like collaborate forever. You know what I mean? So how did you decide like the book? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like the book could have been like, like half as long or 10 times as long. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, you it's should true. Take, take this one, Sashi. <laughs> okay. Um, well, it went on for 10 years. Um, us sort of working on this project and having various iterations of it in performance performances that Arturo and I did at uh, UCLA or Cal State LA or uh, different art galleries where we had artists and community um, activists and an urban farmer uh, who's important in the book um, participate in these sort of live magazine format uh, panel presentations of their work and their art and having an open discussion about community issues in front of a live audience. Um, and we were doing these kinds of things year after year for on and off for 10 years, along with the quote unquote research that we, <laughs> that we, that we engaged in about like how many taco trucks can we hit in a day. Um, but uh, yeah, at some point, at some point, I realized that it was not going to be the giant collaborative effort that I wanted it to be. Like, there was not going to be one chapter written by uh, 10 different people. But if there was going to be 10 chapters, uh, I was probably going to write nine of them. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, there were there were numerous sort of ideas and uh, characters and questions and personalities that were contributed by other people. But I realized sort of 10 years on that I needed to finish it up myself, that I needed to, to undertake the narrative, get the narrative recorded, um, you know, put in, put it in, put it between covers and get the book published. So it kind of ends um, at the, at the giant, um, you know, 50,000 member UTLA uh, strike demonstrations and rallies um, uh, that Arturo and I both participated in. Uh, what year was that Arturo? Like three years ago? What was that? Like, I don't remember. It was like 20, a couple years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2019, 2018, I think. Okay. So a couple of years ago, um, we were part of the the um, the movement to uh, halt privatization of public education in in Los Angeles, which which the strike um, by and large did do, um, and so. I, I wrote the book kind of up to that point and, and let it go there. Did that kind of go there? Okay. Kind of. Yeah, I feel like it's a beautiful ending. I mean, not to, I hope this is not a spoiler, but I feel like there's almost like, like a sense, like if in, in the non-existent Hollywood version of the book, like you, you would confront like the big boss or something, you know, and then there would be a climax, but then, or you have like the savior, you know, maybe Sergio is set up to be the savior, you know, but then instead all you have is actually this sort of like profound and totally quotidian like democracy of like, you know, a mass movement. Um, uh, I don't know if, if I feel like we're hitting uh, the time that uh, Greenlight had told us to go to, but it, I feel like we could keep going for another hour. It's been really lovely to go through this book with you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ken. And thanks for your work <laughs> as organizer and poet, too. No, thank you. Thank but you guys. Buy, buy a copy of the book. <laughs> buy the book. We'll, we'll drop the link one more time in the chat. I want to say thanks so much again to all of you guys for, for creating this beautiful work of art, um, which is, yeah, just I, I could spend ages on it and I, I could listen to this conversation go on and on. But thank you for being with us tonight and and congratulations. Thank <laughs> Have you a good evening. Just going up. I appreciate it. Have a good night. Take care. Good night. Good night.